Open University. Hey, Thomas. Uh, today I want to talk about colour. Um, yesterday I spent the day writing a, an essay, a 2,000-word essay about uh, a Dutch graphic designer for an Italian art magazine, such as my life. Um, and colour entered into it very strongly because this uh, particular designer is... Uh, he's a veteran designer who's... Um, his colour reminds me a lot of the colour of the 1960s. And it's a particular interest of mine to see how um, colours tally with historical epochs. In other words, what is the correlation between a particular set of colours and a particular set of attitudes which prevailed in a particular cultural context? Um, being an academic, this is the kind of thing I think about. So, uh, my pet... Uh, my preferred colour set comes from the 60s, I guess, which probably by no coincidence is the period of my youth. This morning I happened to be watching a, a dumbass choir. I was watching a Jerry Lewis movie called The Nutty Professor, the original 1963 movie. And um, it was remade in the 90s, 1996 or 7, I think, with uh, Eddie Murphy in the title role instead of Jerry Lewis. Um, I haven't seen the... I, I probably wouldn't even watch the uh, Eddie Murphy one. Uh, the lead is, uh, is now a coloured man, but I suspect that the colours themselves will be a lot less gorgeous. The thing that really struck me in the 1963 version of the movie was that uh, the colours of the laboratory, for instance, where Jerry works as the nutty professor, are so vibrant. And there's a, For instance, he goes to a pink gym at some point on the campus where he works. And, and um, I was thinking, where would you now find a, find a pink gym like that? Uh, um, pink is, um, is very big in the early 60s. Uh, it's also... Um, it's not a masculine colour. This is a scene where uh, really big, hunky muscle men keep bumping into Jerry against these bright pink walls. I don't even know the names for certain colours, like this sweater. It might be puce, but I, I'm not even sure what is puce. I think there's... there's um, if you follow David Batchelor, David Batchelor wrote a fantastic book. He's a British artist. Uh, wrote a book called Chromophobia, which uh, says... Makes this, rolls out this big theory that there's been a suppression, a repression of colour in Western culture, really, for, for 2,000 years or more. Um, we think of the Greeks, for instance, as, uh, in Oscar Wilde's terms, Ionian white and gold. But actually those statues which we now see as white and, and pure because they have no colours in them were painted originally by the Greeks, were colourful, were coloured. So this is a, a sort of false reconstruction retrospectively of a, this golden but colourless society. Um, a lot of it goes back to Plato's logocentrism. Plato... Um, as cited in David Batchelor's book, uh, would famously banish uh, the artists from his ideal republic and um, described painters as mere grinders of multicolored drugs. So this association of uh, color with psychedelia and therefore drugs and therefore kind of, uh, a kind of lack of rationality prevails in Western culture, not just in Puritan parts, the Protestant Calvinist parts, but also associations with um, femininity, and um, and with uh, periods of decadence and squalor, or not squalor, um, perhaps uh, there is this uh, theory, the Hemline Index, which is um, was proposed in 1926 by the economist George Taylor, and he said that uh, he'd noticed that women's hemlines go up when there's uh, a bull market and down when there's a bear market. In other words, um, when things are going badly in Western economies, women's skirts are long and hide their knees. Uh, when things are going well, they wear miniskirts, little high miniskirts. Um, 60s, obviously, in Britain, things were booming in the 60s. Um, here in Japan, women still seem to wear pot pants and very short skirts, despite a apparently a 20-year recession. 
Um, so I'm not entirely sure I believe in this correlation, but apparently it has been um, uh, confirmed. Uh, Non-peer-reviewed rev research in 2010 supported the correlation, suggesting that the economic cycle leads the hemline with about three years. So if, uh, if your economy is booming, just wait three years and you will see a lot more of women's legs. Um, I do notice um, living in Japan is a particular um, feeling about color. He hemline might be different. Uh, legs are very much on display in Japan, but uh, there is um, a kind of uh, restriction on color. And when I go across, just hop across the water to South Korea, it's a very different color spectrum. And obviously, for lots of different reasons, it's not just economic cycle, but I do feel that Korea is sort of in the position in its, in its own economic development cycle that Japan was in in, say, the 1960s or 70s. So perhaps what we're seeing in Korea is, um, is partly a, um, a different attitude to color historically. The, the costumes, the historical costumes of Korea tend to have um, the hangul dresses, have very bright pinks and pale blues and yellows in them, which uh, Japanese traditional uh, kimonos don't. They tend to be more natural imagery and subtle greys, greens, um, and not so much for the red spectrum, the red side, the warm colours. What really strikes me is how few kind of serious studies of colour there have been. Of course, Goethe had a, a, a book called his, his, his Theory of Colour, but didn't really present a theory, actually. He was, he was simply looking at what Newton had said about colour. Wittgenstein came along, was very critical of Goethe's um, colour theory in his own book about colour. These people have weighed in on colour, but it's, um, it's a bit like smell, a bit like perfume. It's so difficult to categorise, not just scientifically, but also um, culturally, especially culturally. What is this? I, I keep trying to find a, a correlation between warm colours and liberalism, political liberalism, for instance. But it may well be that economic booms and liberalism go hand in hand, although not in China. You know, you have to keep uh, putting in these caveats. Um, I'm particularly interested in the art world, and I'm interested in how the art world is administered and curated by people wearing almost exclusively black. Uh, this is the, the cliché, the stereotype of the, the art dealer or the gallery owner who wears black every single day and their entire wardrobe back home is just black, 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 because black goes with black and everything's going to work together. But also because there's a kind of hieratic, a priestly function to a curator or a gallery owner or you know, Nick Sirota, whoever it is, they have to look very serious and priestly uh, because they're in a, a corner of culture which is possibly considered frivolous and unmasculine and all the rest of it. But that artists themselves often wear very bright colours. And I'm thinking of the artists I know personally, someone like Rainer Gunnall, I've always noticed that he wears particularly bright colours. And it's almost like the rock world. In, in rock, uh, pop musicians seem to be stuck in the 60s. When everyone else has short hair, the rock stars have their long poodle haircuts and their kind of, uh, their velvets and their kind of um, uh, brushed corduroys and the kind of things people were wearing in the 60s, people seem to wear forever in the rock world. This was how it seemed to me anyway, on creation records especially, because there was a 60s fetish going on there and there was a, this sense that uh, rock musicians could still behave with the, um, the euphoria, the uh, irrational exuberance of the 1960s. But also in the art world there is this sense that uh, this is the, the, another bubble. It's because it's um, financed and, and underpinned by the super rich. It's a kind of hedonistic zone for networking for rich people. That's one of the functions of the art world, whether we like it or not. Um, for the rich, it is still something like the 1960s was for all of us. For this 1% of um, globe-trotting, super-rich uh, billionaires whose wives collect art or whatever, um, it is still a very optimistic time. It's great for them. Everything's booming. They want to see bright colours, collect bright colours, and see artists around them, you know, spicing up their parties who wear bright colours. So this class of people who parachute into international biennials often seem to be wearing much brighter colours. In the same way, it's sort of a stereotypical uniform for an artist to, to avoid what I call the gunmetal grey, which prevails in the rest of the culture. Because the reason I don't want to watch and probably wouldn't enjoy the, um, the remake of The Nutty Professor is that I know that everything, even if the 90s were more colourful actually than, than this decade, this time we're living in, 
Um, I know that it would be mostly gunmetal grey decor clothes. Um, I noticed the difference even between... I watch a lot of um, the Mary Tyler Moore show uh, from the 1970s. Well, actually it started in 69, 68, 69 it actually started. So series... And YouTube, of course, makes you watch these things in tranches of series. Um, just throws up suggestions for your next viewing. And so I'm kind of working through series two. And it kind of at the same time, series five and six, the very late ones before it finished, it was cancelled in, I think, 1977. So you have um, a very significant eight-year stretch of our culture. In my lifetime, I'm kind of an expert in that little... Um, fugue, that little um, um, transition from the 60s into the 70s. Of course, there was this, um, just as in the, the, the late 20s, which was when um, uh, when George Taylor noticed, almost overnight after the crash in 1929, people's hemlines, the, the flappers dropped their hemlines. Uh, same thing happened with, uh, I think in 1973, essentially, there was this uh, sudden radical um, the oil crisis and the three-day week in Britain and uh, a, a sudden sense of pessimism and melancholy. The, the progressive um, advances of the 60s suddenly seemed to be collapsing and reversed. And so you see that. You actually see that in the wardrobe. The early Mary Tyler Moore episodes, she's very brightly coloured. Everything's, you know, she's got a sort of mustard chair in her apartment and she might wear all red one day or all pink or... And Rhoda, of course, is there too. Later on, also there are changes in the acting, the cast. You know, people like Rhoda leave the show and get their own shows. And eventually there's really just Mary and her core team of uh, work colleagues left. But also their clothes change and they start wearing, they still have these um, gull wing collars, which people wore in the 70s, but with checks and much more restrained whites and greys and blacks. And so we get more into the kind of, um, the contemporary feel to me when cars for instance cars now have almost no color uh, cars when I was uh, 12 years old and I was actually still interested in cars the design of cars and the colors of cars cars were mustard purple bright red orange um, all sorts of very vibrant colors uh, ultramarine aquamarine and uh, now they're mostly gray white black um, they have a self-deprecating presence, they look guilty, they look aggressive, their headlights have changed shape. And of course, you can't really dissociate form and colour. Um, form is um, an essential part of colour. And of course, colour co it's a huge topic. I mean, colour combinations, how you play one colour with another colour. Um, I, I started out, I was going to dress in mustard uh, for this presentation with this puce, um, if it is puce, a uh, sweater on top of the mustard and then the sort of armlets which were pink and uh, red socks and stuff like that. But um, in the end I opted for something which was quite neutral, the, the white and the grey, uh, the bluish uh, shirt and then this one element which is colourful. So often it's, it's a bit like an art gallery where you have a white box with one single element which is brightly coloured. Men don't wear pink, that's axiomatic, and men don't have wallets like this, this kind of colour, which probably my camera doesn't even have the capacity to pick up properly. I've noticed that, uh, good though this camera I use is, Fuji Film X Pro 1, it doesn't actually um, do red justice, and uh, even some green books and things I buy, the, the green, when I photograph it, is totally not captured properly. Um, there's this te technological aspect to colour, Often I think the, um, the gorgeousness of early colour films, notably The Wizard of Oz, comes from the fact that colour was just a new thing, was a really big deal, and people would actually go to see a film just for the colours. Uh, and then later on, uh, colour TV came in, in the late 60s. It was an amazing thing to see television programmes in colour, and there was, for a while, a particular attention paid to the colours of sets and costumes on television. And then things just sort of, you know, people get blasé about it and things go back to some kind of norm of inattention. And then uh, the same thing happens with uh, computers. The computers in the, um, I guess, early 90s. I first got my, my, my first com colour computer monitor was for uh, my first Apple computer, actually, which was a, a Duo Dock 230. It was amazing to be able to, to watch CD-ROMs in colour 
for instance, that technology of the early 90s, again, kept, kept happening. Color kept hitting these media and for a while kept being super important and, and then um, would sort of uh, go into the background. Um, my essay yesterday touched on, on uh, business machines and how uh, there are certain moments in the history of uh, industrial design, like for instance when um, Ettore Sossas started working for Olivetti and uh, introduced colors to, uh, to their range, or um, IBM started working with the Ameses, Charles and Ray Ames, who did not only sort of promotional films for them, but um, started putting colors onto their typewriters and things, very sensuous reds and greens and things onto IBMs. Later, Steve Jobs did the same for Apple and used this song, She Comes in Colors, an Arthur Lee song, which is covered by the Rolling Stones. Color, the association of color with orgasm, um, super important for me. You don't have to be a Reichian psychoanalyst to say that um, color is a sensual rush, you know, that uh, does tend to, to remind us in some way of orgasm. Me, anyway, maybe I'm sort of um, kinesthetic somehow. Um, so, and also, um, I think of uh, societies like India, <clears throat> where if you go there, you, there is this um, amazing, it's often described as, wow, it's such a colorful vacation to go to India, but it is um, overwhelming, even for someone like me who hasn't been to India, just to see the, the spectrum of colors that uh, uh, is so common there, uh, and yet it's, these are colors we haven't seen in the West for decades. We don't use those sorts of oranges and yellows and the bright colors which cover someone's whole body. Clothes um, like that have, um, have fallen out of favor. So it's a huge topic, and I, I often feel I could write a book about it. I mean, I turn to my, I've got these nicely colored spines behind me here of the art magazines, Freeze magazine, um, because I'm an occasional contributor. And um, they do a different color of spine for each issue, but I pulled out a random issue to see whether people were talking, whether art critics were talking about color, and I found that they weren't. Um, I looked on two pages. One of them was about a performance art thing, and uh, the other was uh, was about design. It was Alice Rawsthorn's column about design. Neither of them mentioned color once. Uh, it seems like to talk about color in art is almost in for a dig. It's almost um, uh, intellectually, you know, not quite respectable. People prefer to talk about all sorts of. Um, let's try again. Let's see what happens. And it's actually hard and freeze to find any page which is not uh, advertising. I mean, it's obviously full of color. This is a nice purple and red combination here on the front. But nobody's actually making observations about color. Um, blah blah blah. Had a twin work in Kabul by distributing questionnaires to residents of the city. Favoretto identified a number of urban sites that the local community saw as significant, both for personal and public reasons. So yeah, he took a soil sample. It doesn't say placed in wooden boxes. Blah blah blah. Mostly conceptual um, stuff. Uh, um, stuff about society, urbanism, um, theory. Um, blah blah blah. And here we are. Some elements in the program could be said to be rooted in international discourse rather than in the specific context they aim to address. International discourse. So it's sort of this um, uh, the, the wooden tongue. A lot of art writing is the wooden tongue of um, kind of half digested theory uh, from uh, the Frankfurt School, deconstruction, globalization, sociology, urbanism. Uh, conceptualism, all sort of in a big melee or mashup. I try to I try to write more about um, the specific uh, qualities of the work. I do try to just look, and uh, this is this is what Marcel Duchamp called retinal, the retinal art, which he, for him was a bit of an insult that art to be merely retinal um, was was sort of uh, was not enough. Art had to do something conceptual. So you know, and I, I'm not one of these people who disputes uh, Duchamp. Uh, and says he shouldn't be the king of uh, contemporary art still, 100 years later. We are coming up to the 100-year anniversary of the Armut uh, urinal. But, um, but I do think that, I, I mean, I do like artists, um, I, I, I think of Ellsworth Kelly, of Frank Stella, of um, Liam Gillick, uh, the people who use colour in a sort of unapologetic way, uh, and who 
relish colour and who also write books, as David Batchelor did about colour. So it's something I would like to write a book about. It's one of these things that, uh, along with, um, just off the top of my head, I'd love to make a, a novel set in Scarfolk, Richard Littler's um, satirical village. I could probably put some nice 70s colours into that. Open University.